This is Bob Agascari from Laguna Hills. Welcome to your library. This is Elena Garcia in Santa Barbara. Welcome to your library. This is Mary Khalil from the Braille Institute in Los Angeles. Welcome to your library. I'm going to repeat that in Arabic. And I'm Mary Khalil from the Braille Institute in Los Angeles. Marhaban bikum fil maktaba. This is Julius Ancho from San Diego. Welcome to your library. This is Saran Aitayan from Los Angeles. Welcome to your library. Now I'm going to say in Armenian. Sasiran Aitayan, Los Angeles. This is Christian Oleo from Anaheim. Welcome to your library. This is Yancy Munoz in Los Angeles. Welcome to your library. Now I'm going to say it in Spanish. Esta es Yancy Muñoz en Los Ángeles. Bienvenido a tu biblioteca. This is Kelly Hill in Riverside. Welcome to your library. This is Remedio Quito from Braille, Los Angeles. Welcome to your library. And now I'm going to say this in Tagalog. Ito po si Remedio Quito mula sa Braille, Los Ángeles. Maligayang bati, halina sa inyong silid aklatan. Hi, this is Tina Herbison from the Braille Institute in Los Angeles. Welcome to your library and happy National Library Week. Welcome everyone to our online virtual National Library Week program. This year's theme is Welcome to Your Library. We are so glad you are here. What a year it has been. We are thankful that you're here and we're able to welcome you to your library this year. We have some wonderful, extraordinarily talented guests with us today that I know you will enjoy. And the good news is that this video will be available on YouTube. I'm Deanne Tremarkey and I'm a volunteer for the Telephone Readers Program known as TRP here at Braille Institute in Los Angeles. I have enjoyed volunteering here since March 2006. On Mondays, I read world news, sports, and advice. I've also recorded audiobooks for Braille Library, among them Pleasures of the Kitchen, our 100th anniversary cookbook, Trouble at the Watering Hole, The Adventures of Emo and Chicky by Greg Relier and Joshua Weiss. And I am the voice guiding you through the 100 year anniversary exhibit in the bookstore. Debbie Lawrence is our first esteemed guest. Debbie is part of a musical family. Her older sisters sing, her mother played the cello, her dad played a little piano and guitar. He also recited poetry, so it's probably safe to say that her parents passed their love of music and poetry down to Debbie. From the moment Debbie understood how Braille worked, she has been reading and loving it. She says there's nothing like opening a book on a rainy day. Debbie also discovered her love of writing at an early age and was always amazed when her teachers read her compositions or poems to her English classes. Debbie began taking piano lessons at the age of five, has performed with bands, has been a musical director for a local theater, played at the White House, and the most wonderful of all, accompanied Dame Julie Andrews. She says music, reading, and writing are three of the things she loves most. The best thing of all? The books she has read, whether in Braille or on Bard, records or tapes, all have come from the library. It will always be a big part of Debbie's life. We will now hear some lovely poetry from our resident poet, Debbie Lawrence. From a grateful patron. Tina, Kokoi, Saran, and all of the reader advisors work from dusk until dawn to ensure that our library wins prizes. Even throughout this pandemic, they work hard to keep the books flowing. They have coordination systemic, and for this gratitude I am showing. 
Want to sign up for BARD? They can and will gladly assist. No need for a library card. Soon you too will be on a list of patrons traveling near and far without ever leaving their homes. From cold climates to noisy bazaars, with the library you're never alone. Villains, detectives, heroes, or fiends, whether it's fiction or true, and quite a variety of magazines the library can send to you. It's not just a matter of sending out books. There are players to maintain as well. It's not quite as easy as it may look. I'm grateful, and I hope you can tell. Thank you, Mary, Ivan, and Yuri, Fong, Rachel, George, and Darlene, Juana, Yancy, Remedios, TRP, and Rafael, all behind the scenes. From Santa Barbara to San Diego, the staff does their very best to be there for us to make sure that we know they want to meet all our requests. Great job, Debbie. We loved that. Thank you. I am pleased to welcome our first very talented and accomplished narration guest today, Lara Gianarelli, an actor and narrator based in Washington, D.C. Lara has narrated nearly 1,000 audiobooks to date for the Library of Congress. Now we will hear from Lara. Hello, I'm Lara Gianarelli. I'm a narrator at the National Library Service for the Blind and Print Disabled in Washington, D.C. I'm very pleased and honored to be able to be with you today to celebrate National Library Week, albeit only virtually. I've been a narrator here at NLS for a very long time. I graduated from Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. in 1978, and I started here at NLS only a year later. It was recommended to me by someone that I knew from the theater world that I audition here, and when I heard that I could be paid to narrate books out loud, I was beyond thrilled. I've loved books ever since I was a little girl, read voraciously all through school, and so I jumped at the chance to be able to audition to work here. I've worked here since 1979, and they can't get rid of me. I've narrated over a thousand books at this point, all kinds of books across all genres. I've narrated how-to books, romances, family sagas. I've narrated a lot of children's books. Among my very favorite books are the Laura Ingalls Wilder Little House on the Prairie series. I feel very fortunate to have been able to narrate the whole series, and I also narrated Pioneer Girl, which is a sort of a scholarly look at all of Laura Ingalls Wilder's life and her books, and I, I took great pride in working on that, did a lot of research on things about Laura's life and made sure that I got all the pronunciations correct, and it's been um, very rewarding because I hear from time to time from patrons who have listened to the recordings and liked them, and that means the world to me. Um, I've also narrated a lot of other classic children's books. I narrated a Secret Garden, A Little Princess, Little Women, and I've narrated modern kids' books, too, a series of unfortunate events by Lemony Snicket, the one that was made into a movie with Jim Carrey. I also read all of the Eloise books about the little girl who lives in the Plaza Hotel in New York City. I haven't, of course, only narrated children's books. I narrated a lot of wonderful, wonderful literature over the many, many years that I've worked here. Um, things that come to mind specifically are Joyce Carol Oates' books. I narrated a lot of her wonderful, very complex novels. I narrated a wonderful nonfiction book by Sir Michael Holroyd called A Strange Eventful History about the lives and families of those two uh, towering figures in the British theater, Henry Irving and Ellen Terry. That's a really wonderful book, which I would highly recommend to anyone. Um, I've read all kinds of stuff. I've had so many wonderful experiences here at NLS, not just working with my fellow narrators and uh, 
working with them as a monitor, which is what we call the person who engineers the recording when another person is narrating the book. So I've read all kinds of stuff over the years. I've also had lovely interactions with authors. One of my favorite memories is of reaching out to A.S. Byatt, the British author, because I was narrating her book, Babel Tower. And in that book, there is a story within a story. And in this little novel that one of the characters in the book is writing, there are all these characters whose names could either be pronounced in a French way, which made them kind of naughty and have a double entendre, or in a simple English way, which wouldn't make them naughty. And I wasn't sure what the author intended. This was back before the internet was such a big part of our lives. So I called the publisher. I got in touch with the editor. The editor got in touch with uh, A.S. Byatt's agent. And one afternoon, the phone rang here in the recording studio. And my studio director said, I think it's your English actor friend. Well, it wasn't my English actor friend. I picked up the phone and said, hello, this is Laura. And on the other end, yes, hello, A.S. Byatt here. And I nearly dropped the phone. I was so shocked because she's quite a big deal in the, in the literary world. We had a very pleasant conversation. She gave me the answer that I wanted, which was that indeed the names should be pronounced in a naughty way, which made us both smile. And at the end of our conversation, I offered to have her receive a copy of the finished recording, which is something that we offer to all um, authors or people who are involved in the publishing of a book who give us assistance when we're putting the book together. And so Ms. Byatt said, oh, yes, that would be lovely. Oh, no, I would never listen to it. And I, I felt a little embarrassed for a moment, and then I thought, well, of course, she wouldn't want to listen to it. She wrote the thing. She knows every atom that's in it. She doesn't need to hear me read it. But uh, it, it sort of put me in my place, shall we say. Um, another story that actually comes from a book that I worked on as an engineer, as a monitor, rather than as a narrator... A very, very long time ago, a narrator who worked here named John MacDonald was narrating a book called Malafrena, which was a science fiction book written by Ursula Le Guin, the famous, famous writer. And in the book, there was a language in, a, in this foreign language that Ms. Le Guin had made up, and John had no understanding or no idea of how she wanted these things said. So again, this was long before the internet, but he called the publisher, called the agent, got her phone number, called her up, and they spent an hour and a half on the telephone figuring out how the language in Malafrena would be pronounced. And the funniest part of the story is that when he first called her, she was like, oh, Oh, I never thought about how it would be said out loud. So together, they worked out how this language should be pronounced out loud, which was kind of very exciting for all of us involved. I think I would also like to say that my interactions with Talking Book patrons have given me a lot of pleasure over the years. I meet patrons both when they come to NLS on a tour or also when I've traveled around the country to various libraries in the NLS uh, regional library system, and I meet patrons and hear how much the work that we do means to uh, the patrons who use talking books, and it gives me great uh, satisfaction to know that I've played a small part in that recreational reading that people do that can mean so much to all of us who love to read. I've been asked to read a bit of something, and so because we have all spent most of the last year in lockdown in our homes, and I don't know about you, but I've done a lot more cooking than I normally do, it occurred to me to read from a book that I narrated several years ago called American Food Writing. 
It's a compilation of excerpts, essays, poems, and lots of recipes from all across the centuries of cooking in America. So what I'd like to do is read part of an essay that made me smile and made me think of all of us at home this last year busily cooking. So this is from Laurie Colwyn, and it's called Kitchen Horrors. Awful things happen in the kitchen all the time, even to the most experienced cooks. But when it happens to you, it is not comforting to know that you're supposed to learn from your mistakes, especially when you contemplate the lurid-looking mess in front of you. I myself have never made a spinach pie, and therefore I have never had the thrilling opportunity to see one catch on fire. Therefore, I have never watched my husband place his large, wet hiking boot on top of my flaming puff pastry to keep it from burning down the house. But this did happen to a friend. More mundane things happen to me. Half the cake sticks in the bunt pan. The pudding won't unmold from the pudding mold, and when it does, half of it is melted. A really first-rate disaster passes into legend. My sister and I have never forgotten the salmon loaf our mother, an excellent cook, made when we were little. By mistake, she reached for the cayenne pepper instead of the paprika. I was six, my sister was ten, and we remember it as if it were yesterday. My husband recalls a dinner party he attempted to give as a young man around town. The beef stew turned into an ocean of gray juice in which tiny hard cubes of overcooked meat floated. The dessert was to be crepes, but when he removed the batter from the refrigerator, something had gone terribly amiss. The batter had turned into cinder block, and the wooden spoon he had left in it was stuck. Later, it turned out he had used p potato starch instead of flour. These things happen. My own greatest disasters have been the result of inexperience, overreaching, intimidation, and self-absorption. As a blithe young thing, I became quite hipped on a dish called rusty, a Swiss way of frying shredded potatoes in an enormous quantity of butter. I had been introduced to this dish by an English boyfriend who loved to entertain. One night, he invited six people for dinner, and I thought it'd be a swell idea to make rusty. Alone in my beloved kitchen, I began to shred the potatoes into a big bowl. By the time my arm began to get sore, I noticed that the potatoes had taken on a pinkish tinge, but I pressed on. A few minutes later, I looked to see how many more potatoes I needed and observed that a sickly green was now the predominant shade. A few minutes later, my heart throb appeared. Good gracious, he said. What's that funny black stuff? There was no doubt about it. That funny black stuff was my potatoes. Into the garbage they went. And on that note, I am thankful to be able to have been with you for even just a brief amount of time today from the recording studio here at NLS where I narrate books, and I wish you all very well. Take care. Thank you, Laura. We really enjoyed that. And now, our second amazingly talented and also very gifted narrator guest of the day is Mayor Trevathan. Mayor has led immersive theater in Ahmedabad, studied Chekhov in Vladivostok, performed in Barrow, and lived in Paris and Tokyo. Colorado has been her home since 2001. Mayor has recorded something like 700 titles for the National Library Service, Dreamscape, Audible, and others. And now we will hear from Mayor. Hello, 
I'm Mayor Trevathan. So pleased to be with the Braille Institute, be it online, for National Library Week. Uh, for those of you who are blind or have low vision, I am a white woman. I have gray hair. I have it worn up away from my face today. I'm wearing a black uh, v-neck shirt and a long sleeve black cardigan. And to my sides and behind me are patterned fabrics. And that's because I'm coming at you from my home audio recording studio in Longmont, Colorado, where um, I don't see daylight for long stretches of time. So to have a little cheer in the place, I've got these fabrics up. And it also helps to dampen the sound leaking in. Um, I have been a narrator with National Library Service for 12 or 13 years, something like that. I got into it because I was in the Denver theater scene as an actor and director. And at the same time, so were established uh, narrators for National Library Service, like Martha Harmon Pardee and Gabriella Cavallaro and Eric Samvold. And so when an opening for a female narrator came along, they recommended me and I auditioned for the Library of Congress. And uh, here I am now in my basement. <laughs> I actually think that this transition um, from stage to audiobooks is a really lovely thing to happen for an actor because I get to play all of the roles and I don't have to spend any time in hair and makeup. <laughs> Uh, I don't have to worry about my costume, um, so it's it, it really is a blast. I do miss live audiences. Um, uh, since March of 2020, I moved everything to my home audio studio, where previously I at least had had uh, an audience of one, a cohort um, who was reading along with me, making sure that I had everything word perfect and was pronouncing things uh, correctly and punching the buttons of uh, being a sound engineer. But um, with COVID, uh, everything now happens here in my, my basement studio. And I sure do miss being able to, um, I'm a crier. I'm just, I, I have been all my life. And so if I'm reading a beautiful book and I'm moved, I feel a little embarrassed. Sometimes I'm crying. And then I'll look out across the glass separating me from that monitor, the sound engineer, and see that they too, of course, are having the same reaction. And <laughs> I'll feel much better about uh, the, the, uh, the state of humanity, if you will. Um, and so I've, I've, I've missed being around humans most certainly. One of the sole reasons that I'm on Facebook is because it seems to be where BARD and NLS listeners will find me. Um, so I'm going to spell my name in case you want to reach out there. This is not fishing for compliments, but uh, if you feel like letting me know what you're reading, what you're interested in reading, what you didn't like reading, I love hearing from you. It's uh, M-A-R-E-T-R-E-V-A-T-H-A-N. I've read mm, about 700 books and, I mean, narrated about 700 books. And though that's nothing compared to, well, for example, the three narrators who I previously mentioned, um, it is enough that for my brain, I mostly take the words in and they come out of my mouth and none of them stick in the brain area. So um, when people ask me about recommended books or favorite books, I, I get a little, a little stymied. Um, so I did take a look at a list of things that I've narrated through the years. All of these would be found on BARD or in NLS. And these are ones that really did stick out and wouldn't necessarily have been on anybody's radar because so I don't think that they were major award winners or bestsellers, but were lovely little books. So I'm going to give you just a few titles here in case you're interested. 12 Tales, no, sorry, 12 Tribes of Hattie, H-A-T-T-I-E. The Enchanted Life of Adam Hope. I This one really stuck with me. It's um, about a man born of the mud during a storm. And um, he's sort of this um, kind golem figure who doesn't age. But other than that, engages in this really ordinary 
life with, you know, a, a marriage and children and, and life on a farm. And there's this magical realism element um, of everybody else, of course, aging around him. And it's really thoughtfully, beautifully written, I think. Um, one of the most challenging books for me personally to ever narrate is called A Girl is a Half-Formed Thing. This title may ring a bell because uh, I think it made several top 10 lists in the year that it was published. It's all first person, an Irish girl, and I'm not sure that there's a complete sentence in the whole thing. It's all this stream of consciousness sentence fragments. And I found that it really transport, the writing was, was um, so masterful that it really transported me into the mindset of this young woman. Um, Probably most of you know about Choice Listening Magazine, but if you don't, oh my goodness, uh, uh, it's reliably the thing that I love narrating most. The editors are such thoughtful curators, um, such a great variety of material, and always um, uh, intellectually uh, provocative and well written. Um, and then just one more, and this is in case uh, you have any YA fans in your household. There is a superhero series called Dreadnought, D-R-E-A-D-N-O-U-G-H-T, which is about a transgender superhero. And talk about representation matters and how, um, you know, there are so many voices that have been marginalized and practically ignored. And um, this is a delightful series of books. Um, so I encourage you to take, uh, take a look at that. I'm going to read just a couple of things uh, today. The first one, is from a book that I'm currently narrating here in the basement. Uh, it's called The Enigma Game. And so it'll be, it'll be out soon. It's set in World War II in Britain. What did you show that man? I asked. I was supposed to help her with her papers, and here was something she'd kept to herself. The old woman gave a slow, shy smile, as if she were the one who was a bit embarrassed this time. British passport. More ordinary than mine, even. The smiling photograph, pasted inside, was definitely a recent picture of the person sitting next to me. At least, it wasn't taken so long ago, you couldn't tell who it was. But the name read clearly. Jane Warner, British subject by birth. It also said she was a musician, and it said she was born in Aberdeen, in Scotland, in 1868, ten years later than the date on Johanna von Arnhem's alien registration card. You can call me Jane, said the old woman. It's what I call myself. I stared at the lying document, then looked up at the person who called herself Jane. The shy smile was gone. She watched me seriously, trusting me with a secret. How did you get this? I demanded. It came out sounding very stern, and her thin shoulders cringed a little. Perhaps she was expecting me to take it away from her. That's what they'd have done at Russian camp if they'd known about it. It was my husband's, she said defiantly. I kept it when he died. It wasn't until I was already locked up in that miserable place that I started fiddling with it. Of course, they knew who I was, but I've called myself Jane Warner since the early thirties. And who doesn't look forward to a better life ahead? I thought I should be ready if the chance arose. It was simple to fix. A razor and ink is all it took. Rubbing the raised stamp onto the photograph was the difficult bit. She was more of a rule-breaker than I'd realized. And this second selection is from the wonderful online publication McSweeney's.net. And this is called It's Just a Beach Read by Madeline Trebensky. Oh, this? Uh, it's just a beach read. <laughs> I honestly don't know how it got into my tote bag. I'm pretty sure it's not even mine. When I'm not at the beach, I carry a well-worn copy of Ulysses in this bag. In fact, I don't plan on opening this book at all. I might just toss it into a sand pit. 
if I do decide to open this frivolous beach read, ironically, of course, I can assure you that its pages will only ever see hot summer sunlight beating down upon them, for they are not worthy of the cool, fluorescent light of a true intellectual space. However, I'm at the beach right now, and it's undeniable that as a society, we've informally agreed upon the beach as an acceptable place for books like this. Thrillers, romance novels, and any work of contemporary fiction featuring a female protagonist. Why allow such mindless literary debauchery here? Maybe because it's a mystical, liminal space. Not quite land, not quite sea. The demilitarized zone of academic posturing. What's read at the beach stays at the beach, right? Like this book here. Which I only opened because I thought my car keys might be inside it. You know, I can't quite shake the feeling that you still think this is the type of book I normally read. It's not that I want to read this simplistic nonsense about two co-workers pretending to hate each other despite their undeniable sexual chemistry. It's that I couldn't risk any of my big important books being exposed to the damp ocean air. In my defense, this particular read isn't like other beach reads. In my very limited reading of it, which I succumbed to out of extreme and life-threatening boredom, I found that some parts were actually kind of good. I mean, not like a white man with an MFA would recommend it good, but that's a high bar for any female author to clear without being a, brawny, a Bronte sister. That said, if I was safely inland, away from the corrupting influence of the coast, I would never be so weak-willed as to fall for the allure of such blatant escapism. I'm a true literary purist who delights in books that make me feel as if I've just slogged through mental quicksand while bearing the burden of existential dread and the fate of humanity on my shoulders. This ridiculous beach read is far too cliched, derivative, and... Oh, you've read this book too. Oh, it's so good, right? <sighs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you so much, Mare. That was great. And next, for your entertainment, we have David Nash, a multi-talented performer and musician. David Nash was born and grew up in Seattle, Washington, where he followed his passions for piano, organ, and dancing. At the same age, he learned to read and write. He earned a scholarship at the University of Washington Dance Department. From there, he went to work as a dancer in Las Vegas. After that, he worked as choreographer with Seattle Civic Light Opera. David choreographed shows, including Hello, Dolly, Evita, Anything Goes, and many more. Some years later, he played keyboards for a pop band in San Francisco and was featured in the New York and LA Times for singing show tunes at Sunday morning church services in Los Angeles. While in Los Angeles, he enjoyed entertaining seniors, and more recently, he has been delighted to study music at the Braille Institute. David plays the organ with the Braille Institute pop band. And now we will hear David's delightful music. Hello, my name is David Nash. I study music at the Braille Institute. Today, I'm very happy to join in with the Braille Institute as they celebrate National Library Week. I'd like to thank my music teacher, Faye Roberts, and Tina Herbison for inviting me to play a couple of songs for you. First, one of my all-time favorites, Pennies from Heaven, followed by Johnny Mercer's big hit, Accentuate the Positive. Please sit back, relax, and I hope you enjoy the music.
David. That was beautiful. Our National Library Service could not function very well without a dedicated, hardworking, and brilliant Assistant Chief for the Patron and Network Engagement Division. I am pleased to introduce Stephen Prime. Stephen Prine is the Assistant Chief for the Patron and Network Engagement Division for the National Library Service for the Blind and Disabled, Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. He has worked as a Network Consultant of National Library Service for the Blind and Print Disabled in D.C. He was the Director of Library Services for the Blind and Physically Handicapped at the South Carolina State Library in Casey, South Carolina. Stephen has been both Librarian 1 and 2 for the South Florida Regional Library and Florida Regional Library for the Blind and Physically Handicapped in Daytona Beach, Florida, respectively. Stephen has co-authored with Jane Calton an article entitled Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped, which was published in the online edition of the Encyclopedia of Library and Information Sciences, 4th edition. He has also co-authored with George Thoroni. They wrote an essay for the National Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped, which was published in the Encyclopedia of the Library of Congress. That article was published in February 2005. Welcome, Stephen. Hello, my name is Steve Prine. I'm the Assistant Chief of the Patron and Network Engagement Division at the National Library Service for the Blind and Print Disabled which is part of the Library of Congress. I was asked to speak today about the future of NLS and its network of cooperating libraries and the service to eligible readers throughout the country. But to talk about that, I need to talk about the past first. There was no national program for blind individuals up through the early 1930s. But in the late 20s, the blind community began to lobby Congress in support of such a program and major organizations serving the blind, the American Foundation for the Blind in New York, the American Printing House for the Blind in Louisville, Kentucky, and the Braille Institute of America in Los Angeles, California, also lobbied. And the result of that effort was the Pratt Smoot Act named for Ruth Pratt, a representative from the Garden District in New York, and Reed Smoot, Senator from Utah, who, had do, in, who introduced identical bills into the House 
and Senate, and which was which was signed into law by President Her Herbert Hoover on March 3, 1931. The law authorized the Library of Congress to provide books in an embossed format to adult blind residents of the United States. It also authorized the Librarian of Congress to come to agreement with regional centers for the distribution of these materials. 19 libraries across the country joined the Library of Congress in 1931 in the provision of this service, making it one of the oldest and long longest in terms of continuous use net library networks in the country. The Pratt Smoot Act was amended again in 1934 to include sound recordings. And another seven libraries joined the network at that point. So from 1935 through 1950, the Library of Congress and 26 libraries provided service to blind individuals throughout the country. In, with both Braille and on in the audio side, 33 and a third records, which were actually developed or patented by the American Foundation for the Blind for this program. And we use exclusively through the 30s and 40s. It wasn't until the 1950s that the LP became commercially viable. And by then NLS was looking at changing formats. At any rate, the law was uh, um, amended again in 1952 to remove the word adult so that blind children could be served. In 1962 to provide a music service for blind musicians, which is basically musical scores in braille and or large print, which was called bold note. The law was amended again in 1967 to extend service to physically handicapped individuals. Anyone who cannot hold a book or turn the pages easily was eligible for the program. NLS moved from the records to an analog cassette format in the early 70s and began to provide books on cassette at special speeds and playback equipment to network libraries to provide to readers. And books on cassette were provided for really 40 years until we began to move to the, the current format, which was a digital format. NLS knew in the early 90s that a change needed to be made and began to look at what could be done. It was, a, it was easily agreed that digital recording was what we wanted to do, but the, the format that would be used was still in question. At that time, there were six different formats. There were compact disc, um, digital audio tape, digital compact cassette, DVDs, mini disc, and flash memory. Of those six, flash memory was the most expensive with a megabyte of memory costing approximately $25,000. However, projections showed that after the turn of the century in the first decade of the new century, that the cost would be, would be more in line with what NLS could afford. So we moved towards that goal. We were able to migrate to digital talking books on flash memory cartridges in 2009, providing the libraries and both books and digital players that they in turn begin to loan to, to readers. And that really emulated the previous change from record to cassette and then cassette to digital. The same service patterns were con being moved forward, but we also had some other changes that we were beginning to look at. In 1999, 
and I'll set up a website for Braille titles that have BRF files. And so Braille readers with a professional Braille display of their own and internet access and a computer could download Braille books directly. And that proved very popular. In 2006, NLS began to experiment with an audio download site, which eventually became BARD, Braille Audio Reading Download. It was open to all NLS readers in 2009 when we began to provide digital players to, to the network. <clears throat> but we've continued to improve on BARD and expand it. Uh, we introduced an app for iOS devices. So readers with, with their own iOS device could actually get the app, download books directly to, to their device. And then an Android device app so that people with Android devices could do the same. In 2013, we merged the Braille website and the audio website into one. So our truly became the one stop for service for both Braille and audio books and magazines for network readers. Today we have 121,000 plus books or audio books on BARD with some 9,000 of those titles being provided by network libraries, local recording programs. There are probably 18,000 magazines divided pretty evenly between audio and braille. And we see that as a way of, of, of serving readers. As we move forward, we've also introduced duplication on demand, which allows a library circulation system, rather than printing a mailing card to be put in, placed in a book and put into the mail, to actually record the title or titles onto one cartridge and then print a mailing card so the card and the cartridge could be put in a mailing container and put into mail. And this has been a great deal of change at the at the library level in terms of processing books, but it also meant that libraries don't have to continually pull from shelves, send, reshelve. So that that effort is certainly going away. So and it's worked well for readers because they get multiple titles on one cartridge. It's worked well for the post office because there are fewer cartridges in the in the mail stream at any one time. And so we see this going forward as a way for most of our network to provide books. Currently we're a little over we're almost at two thirds of our network libraries using duplication on demand. We hope within another 12 months that that all of the libraries will be will be using it. Our law was amended, has been amended again in 2016 to remove the word sound before reproducers in um, our law. So that by taking the word sound out, we could then actually provide refreshable rail displays. And so we begin a process of contracting to acquire refreshable rail displays, which we are calling Braille e-readers. And in the late summer of 2020, we started a pilot with regional libraries in each of the four uh, conferences with phase one. And in another month, we expect to start a phase two with library with additional libraries in each of the four conferences with a second e-reader device. At the end of the year, we hope to be able to make a decision as to which of these devices or both we'll move forward with. And in FY22, begin to purchase Braille e-readers in quantity. Our goal is to provide them to network libraries the same way we provided digital talking book machines or audio players and libraries in turn will then use those to provide braille service to readers either uh, the reader will download materials directly or the library will will put books on brf files onto a cartridge and mail them out through the mail 
in 2018, the United States signed the Marrakesh Treaty. And so our most recent change of law is to bring our, um, our authorizing legislation into line with the Marrakesh Treaty language so that NLS as, a, as an entity can both borrow and lend material with libraries in other countries and in other languages. So to date, we probably have 95 audio titles and 10 braille titles from other libraries on BARD, but this number will expand exponentially in the next few years. We're also looking at the, the feasibility of smart speakers being used to access books. Our real goal going forward is to provide eligible readers with a variety of ways to access our books and magazines in a way that works best for them and to cut down on the workload at our network libraries. But at the same time, our network libraries provide, will play an ever more important role in terms of service, in terms of, of provision of, of playback equipment, audio or braille, in terms of technical support for equipment, audio or braille, in terms of reader advisory service for um, patrons and for um, outreach activities. Going forward, we see patrons really kind of falling into two categories, independently linked patrons who use BARD on their own directly or library linked patrons who are getting the benefits of BARD and all it has to offer through their regional library or their network library. And so that's our goal going forward. In March 3rd, 2021, we celebrated our 90th anniversary and the services we provide today are light years ahead of what was provided in 1931 or even 1935 when NLS reaches its 100th anniversary in March of 2031. We, I think the service will be light years ahead of where we are even today. The whole purpose of NLS and its network libraries is our basically our mission statement, which is that all may read. And we will continue to move toward that goal with our network libraries in term to provide service to readers who have who may not have other options for reading material. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today and tell you a little bit about NLS. And thank you for attending this program. Thank you, Stephen. We are celebrating our library all week long here at Braille Institute. I want to take the opportunity once again to thank all of our guests today and all of you library patrons out there who will be watching our virtual National Library Week program available to you on YouTube. You know, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for you. Thank you, Laura, Mare, Debbie, David, Stephen, Tina, Kokoi, and the BIA library staff and BIA marketing team, volunteers, all of you for sharing your talents with us and for joining us today. A quote from Rita Dove says, the library is an arena of possibility opening both a window into the soul and a door onto the world. And after living through 2020 and part of 2021, Lauren Ward says, libraries always remind me that there are good things in this world. I am Deanne Tremarkey, and I hope you enjoyed our program today and that you'll benefit from the workshops we have for you all week. We look forward to being together with you in person soon. Bye.